morning. Uh, my name is Christopher Ames, and uh, I'll be speaking to you today about uh, cervical deformity surgery. I'd like to thank Medtronic and uh, Larry and uh, Ron Lehman for, for inviting me to give uh, this talk, and my co-moderator, uh, Frank Shen, who will be uh, discussing uh, questions uh, at the end of the talk. Uh, my disclosures. I'm gonna be talking in the next uh, 25 minutes or so uh, about our approach to cervical deformity. And um, I always like to place these talks uh, sort of as a story where we came from. So about probably about eight or nine years ago now, the International Spine Study Group uh, asked me to head up the cervical deformity research program for that uh, multi-center uh, research consortium. And when we came into this problem, we realized that spinal deformity, a cervical deformity really came in, in all shapes and sizes. And we didn't have an operational paradigm on how to really think about these cases. We didn't really even know and understand exactly what radiographic and structural abnormalities produce these different uh, morphologies. And even more so, we didn't realize uh, anything really about the goals of correction, except maybe a little bit about chin brow vertical angle. And um, so our first approach was to, to try to start to classify these. And we realized very early on there was a significant difference between very severe cervical deformity like this patient with more than 100 degrees of rigid cervical kyphosis who probably needs a double uh, PSO a and this patient who had a more had a milder deformity more of a translational cervical deformity but still was quite rigid and would require for example a three column osteotomy at some risk to correct this mild deformity which even though much less in magnitude was still significantly symptomatic and these are her films. She had a prior uh, uh, long fusion for AIS. You can see the translational deformity of the head, the fact that it's rigid. And she underwent uh, correction uh, with a posterior three column osteotomy. And we have this type of patient who uh, doesn't even seem, at least from a, a clinical appearance standpoint, to have a cervical deformity because it's completely compensated. These patients are much like uh, the flat back patients, for example, uh, that compensate with their pelvis. They can hide their deformity through hyperlordosis. This is often uh, at the uh, occipital cervical junction, as I'll discuss in a moment, but also they can hide it a bit with pelvic tilt and even lumbar uh, hyperlordosis. When we ask them to assume a position of comfort, that's when uh, they uncover the deformity, they relax their compensation, and you can see uh, they fall forward uh, in, into a, a more relaxed position, more comfortable position, because they don't have that increased energy expenditure. And then we're up against this sort of issue where surgeons have often been inclined to treat uh, the regional deformity, like this patient had a segmental uh, kyphosis, uh, and if, you're, if you carefully study the films, you can see that there's some scalloping of C1 potentially indicating a long-standing type of potentially subjacent deformity. This patient underwent a regional correction, which would have been you know, many years ago, a lot of surgeons approach to this with early failure. Again, a uh, revision with again, early failure. And really what uh, was the driving issue for this patient all along was a uh, upper thoracic kyphosis with compensation at the occipital cervical junction. And then this patient ended up needing a three column osteotomy again uh, to correct that. So that was kind of an overview of, of where we've come from and why this is important to understand. We're subjecting these patients to uh, much more uh, risky operations to try to reach certain goals. And one of the questions we have to ask is, is, is it worth it? Um, and how bad off are these patients with cervical deformity? So we can place this in the context of other very significant disease processes. And this was a study headed up by Justin Smith in our group, where we looked at the uh, EQ5D scores of cervical deformity patients versus other chronic serious diseases and found that it was right there between emphysema and blindness. So actually uh, th these patients are significantly disabled. Um, this is a deep dive that I did. We recently published in the online version of, of neurosurgery, uh, looking at uh, national uh, economic and industry databases, showing that not only is this a complex problem to understand, but also that the rates of these types of surgeries is really going up uh, over the last uh, 15 years or so. And in fact, it's the most rapidly growing area uh, in the cervical spine. 
uh, much more so than non-deformity uh, type cases with a compound annual growth over 13% versus 6%. So as an industry, uh, as surgeons that are looking at this population, you know, this is really a significant growth area. And just like in the thoracolumbar spine, as I'll discuss in my AI talk later today, uh, unfortunately, uh, the largest group where this type of surgery seems to be growing is in the older, more frail population. So, of course, that generates a whole lot of other issues with uh, complications and even mortality. And I take a little step back and think about, you know, what, how we came into this problem. How, what did we have to understand? And I remember when I was a fellow and my, I, I, did, I did a fellowship with Volker Sontag at the BNI, whenever there was any sort of cervical kyphosis, we, we kind of always looked at that as, as abnormal and pathologic to, in, to some extent. But when you take a deep dive into the normative data, you find that actually 32% of spines are kyphotic at baseline. So just simply saying kyphosis itself uh, should be treated uh, in a symptomatic patient, that's not sophisticated enough to really understand the problem. So then we start out and try to figure out what produces a normal cervical morphology. Uh, well, we did this uh, deep dive with Virginie Lafage in 2013, where we looked at the impact of pelvic incidence, and we found that pelvic incidence itself, through a chain of correlation, had a significant impact on normative cervical alignment. The higher the PI, the more the cervical lordosis. Also, interestingly, um, the um, Clivocervical angle, the skull base in certain congenital deformities affects the normal position of the cervical spine, and probably also some of the thoracic inlet angle and thoracic cage itself, the thoracic uh, rib cage anatomy and upper thoracic spine also affects this too. So it's not purely a pelvic incidence relationship, but that's a big driver. Um, to review some of the literature in this area, uh, we published this study uh, several years ago uh, in uh, neurosurgery showing a significant correlation of the cervical sagittal plane to disability scores. So remember I mentioned when we started out in this problem, we didn't realize you know, why these patients were disabled, what was really driving this. And so we developed this correlation to the C2 plumb line that gave us at least some sort of guidepost in this confusing world where we uh, began to take a deep dive in cervical uh, alignment. We then did a regression analysis, just like they did for the Schwab SRS classification, and found a threshold of about four centimeters. So uh, even now, we use that as our realignment target to try to get these patients at less than four centimeters. And it's a little bit more complicated than in the thoracolumbar spine, and I'll discuss that in a moment. We then wanted to develop a correlate of the PI minus LL. It makes sense, right, that, that the uh, lumbar lordosis needs to match the pelvic incidence. In a similar fashion, the cervical lordosis needs to match the T1 slope. So uh, this is the sort of idea behind this. The higher the T1 slope, the more cervical lordosis is required to balance the head. And if the neck becomes flatter, maybe through a, a cervical fusion or through a degenerative process, it doesn't account for that. You can have this sort of flat neck phenomenon with a translated head uh, deformity. We then did a regression analysis for this parameter and found a T1 slope minus CL value of about 20 degrees, uh, which is easy to remember, uh, that seems to correlate with an increase in disability scores and cervical translational uh, deformity. Then we wanted to take a deeper dive at chin brow vertical angle. This is work that was headed up in our group by Themi Pratipsaltis, where we found that below negative 4.8 and above 17, Patients have a significant drop off in their disability scores, indicating that this range is probably appropriate with some subtle nuances, perhaps for the ankylosing spondylitis patient who should be kept a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit head down in their chin brow vertical angle. Uh, but nonetheless, this gives us kind of a working paradigm and was useful for the early uh, iteration of our classification. This is a parameter that didn't make it into our classification, uh, at least in version one, but is an important parameter to look at which is the hyperlordotic deformity at the occipital cervical junction. When you see that sort of scalloping, like I showed you in the first uh, case, or one of the first cases, it, it's important to look below. That probably indicates a longstanding cervical deformity with uh, compensation. The value we use is around 30 degrees. When the C1, C2 lordosis is beyond about 30, 32 degrees, it does imply to, to, that you need to look at for some adjacent uh, deformity that's driving that translational deformity of the head. And this did correlate to neck, uh, neck pain scores through, again, probably muscular expenditure and muscular uh, compensation. 
Now here's a kind of a quick and dirty way to localize the apex of these deformities. And as I'll show you uh, when I show you the classification, the apex is an important <clears throat> parameter to, to localize it and classify it. So when you have a, a low C2 tilt and a high T1 slope, that implies that the apex is in the thoracolumbar spine. That's very quick. You look at C2, you look at T1. Now, when you have a low T1 slope and a high C2 slope, that implies the apex is in the cervical spine, maybe an isolated cervical deformity. But life is always a lot more complicated. And many times patients have higher T1 slopes and higher C2 slopes. And sometimes they have a mixed deformity pattern. And that's important to recognize as well. I wanna have enough time at the end to talk about treatment. So I'm not gonna belabor all the aspects of the classification, but essentially on the left, we have apex location. I showed you how to do that. On the right, we have uh, the modifiers that uh, have a clinical impact. And so this is how we initially put together from those widely varying uh, initial images of cervical deformity, trying to make sense of it. Now I'll kind of bring it together in terms of some of the, the, the clinical uh, patterns at the end. But I wanna show you where we're going with this. And just like we brought AI and, non -su and unsupervised learning into our thoracolumbar classification, as I'll discuss this afternoon, we've also brought non -supervi unsupervised learning into our cervical deformity classification. And this is work that was uh, done by Virginie Lafage and Hanjo Kim uh, with us at uh, HSS and published. And essentially what the AI told us when they took an independent pattern recognition look at our cervical deformity database, was it essentially the computer's telling us you guys basically have three types of cervical deformity. One is flat neck when the cervical lordosis is not enough to compensate for the T1 slope, but it does in extension. And those patients usually need a C2 to T1, two or three. Then you have the focal deformity group in the cervical spine, and they often can get by with just a cervical fusion, maybe best done anteriorly if possible. At least that's what some of our work that we uh, presented in NAS uh, showed for low-grade flexible deformities in the past. So you should give some consideration to staying in the cervical spine um, and uh, doing an anterior cervical fusion. The final group is a cervical thoracic deformity. Unfortunately, this is a group I deal most with in my practice. They have a very high T1 slope, and these patients may need a three-column osteotomy and going to the lower T-spine. So it's really interesting to me that the AI can take a totally independent look uh, at our cases and potentially uh, give us interesting information about how to treat them. Now, what are some of the problems with uh, cervical deformity classification? One is, we're realizing in our research work, is that what's important to a patient with severe deformity in terms of their HRQOL, which a lot of this is classification work is built on, it's very different from a patient with mild deformity. So what, what, what's important to them, like chin brow vertical angle and function, totally different from someone with low-grade deformity who may have more um, arthritic uh, pain, excuse me. <clears throat> so that's one issue. Also, the patients have very high complication rates. So if you're trying to do uh, classification that's going to help you to realign the patient and hit certain targets and see if that's important for how they do post-op, a high complication rate is going to affect that and impact it and confound it. So that's one other issue. The other is, unlike in the thoracolumbar spine, we don't have a good instrument, HRQOL instrument, for cervical deformity. NDI is terrible uh, for getting at what's really important to these patients. And uh, our group is working to develop uh, and validate what we call the SRS22C, which is a multi-domain HRQOL for the cervical spine. So we hope to do uh, more work uh, and present more of that work uh, in a couple of years. Now, bringing it all together and bringing it back to the patient, low-grade uh, cervical apex location deformities often don't have a manifestation in the appearance domain. So we need to th start talking and thinking more like deformity surgeons. So an impact in pain and myelopathy potentially, but not in appearance. What produces the, classical, the classic chin on chest? Well, that's usually a cervical thoracic apex. And they have impacts across all domain. And what produces the translated head, but the maintenance of chin brow vertical angle, uh, that's usually a T1 slope minus cervical lordosis abnormality. So if you think back to that original slide, now I'm sort of, I'm teaching you what produces those various patterns. And I think back to the AI and some of the recommendations, you can see that bringing it all together, you're starting to get some, some treatment ideas as well. And then this patient, for example, has a cervical complaint, difficulty holding his head up, but he has a thoracic apex. 
producing a high T1 slope, but still his manifestation mainly that he's complaining about is an inability to hold his head up. <clears throat> and then occasionally we have patients that have uh, cervical scoliosis, uh, like this patient. And uh, he had a primary complaint in the appearance domain, which you'll realize is absolutely not captured by the NDI. And this pa that patient underwent um, a uh, correction for his scoliosis. Well, how about this patient? This patient, again, has primarily an appearance-related complaint. He's an adult. We get three foot films. He was really complaining about his neck, not his low back or thoracolumbar spine. And this patient actually didn't need a neck operation, even though that was his primary complaint. He needed a hemivertebra resection with spontaneous resolution of his cervical uh, alignment. And then we have this type of patient. I mentioned briefly before, we wanna realign while maintaining a little bit of head down position so the patient can be stable when walking downstairs. And this patient needed initially a thoracolumbar osteotomy, the classic AAS patient, but also ended up needing more osteotomies to get a, a final good correction. We look for this sign called the trapezius sign. We examine these patients over time to see the flexibility of their deformity. And we also look very carefully at the overall physiologic state of the patient. Many of these patients are frail and cachectic. It represents a quite a different uh, population of patients from uh, the typical thoracolumbar patients. And these patients often need preoperative prehabilitation optimization. Finally, we look carefully at the uh, soft tissue envelope. Many of these patients will require plastic surgery to pull some muscle flaps in, some paraspinal muscle to optimize their result. Uh, without doing that and merely correcting the sagittal plane deformity, these patients can still have significant pain. Now for uh, planning your corrections, it's very important to ask these patients to assume a position of comfort. What this does is essentially the same thing as asking them to relax their pelvis and, and correcting their pelvic uh, alignment with their, with their thoracolumbar alignment. In a similar fashion, you have to correct their occipital cervical hyperlordosis. So you relax that and that gives you your osteotomy angle, which is gonna be greater uh, than if you didn't account for that. Just a, a couple slides on outcomes. This is all very preliminary. We, we have um, the largest series to date and we are getting uh, some improvement in their NDI scores and their function EQ5D scores, um, but we're not moving the needle as much as we, as much as we had hoped, but, but still, Cervical deformity surgery, we are improving these patients. It's an active topic uh, for uh, discussion. Finally, in the last uh, five minutes or, or so before we have uh, discussion, talk a little bit about our techniques uh, for treatment. First thing we needed to do was develop a common nomenclature for our soft tissue releases and our bony releases. I'll refer you to the journal Neurosurgery Spine to go into the osteotomies and, and releases in some de in detail. We essentially graded them in a very similar way to the Schwab uh, uh, osteotomy classification in the thoracolumbar spine. And we'll concentrate mostly on the type six osteotomies. But before we do that, I wanna show you a very simple method to uh, prevent deformity. And I think we're gonna talk a little bit about this at the end of the session. The first thing we always do in a flexible case that doesn't have significant stenosis is we bring the back of the head back level to the thoracic apex. If we're correcting a deformity, we don't feel like we're done until the head is at the level of the thoracic apex. So we actually will place our hand on the head to do a final uh, correction. Nowadays, uh, we're using uh, precision rods. Uh, we've been doing this even in our cervical deformity cases using the Metacrea product uh, for a couple of years now. And this rod represents a template for our alignment. So it gives us a double check, hand on the back of the head, use of the precision custom rod, uh, including the PSO. And that makes us feel like, uh, you know, we've done uh, an adequate job on the table. And here's just an example of a typical custom rod case, a severe cervical thoracic deformity. We plan this with Metacrea in the hub. And then we have a custom rod, which serves not only as a rod, but also as a template for the alignment. And you can see this patient had ankylosing spondylitis. We left him with about five to 10 degrees of head down um, and got exactly the rod that was built fit, fit exactly uh, into the patient with our uh, improvement in post-op alignment. And here you can see the rod going in and the closure of the osteotomy like we do it simultaneously. 
We published our technique for cervical three column osteotomies. I refer you to the Journal of Neurosurgery Spine 2011 for the technique, um, but just a, a couple pearls uh, as we finish up. Number one, the space available for a cervical three column osteotomy is much less. So we uh, developed these uh, conical taps that are very useful to de decancellate between the nerves without using a high speed burr. Um, you can use a lumbar tap to do this. I'll also show you that technique. But otherwise, it's quite similar to what you do in the thoracolumbar spine. We dissect the lateral border of the vertebral body. And then uh, we do our decancellation. Here's an example of using the conical tap to decancellate. Finishing the decancellation, we use the racks in the final stages to stabilize the, uh, pay, stabilize the osteotomy site. We don't use a lot of temporary rods. And then the central impactor takes down the back wall, the vertebral body. And the final, finally, um, this is a Mitsuho attachment. I don't have anything to do with that company, but it's very useful for correcting the head position at surgery. So literally we'll reach down, it's like power steering. We hit the button and we can lift that up and down. Uh, and that's how we close the osteotomy in conjunction with some cantilever force on the rod. We get about 19 degrees of correction with a C7 uh, PSO. Um, and here's an example of a case, translational deformity, rigid, you can see it's rigid there in the supine position. This patient had a long-standing old osteo, and he underwent uh, a C6 and C7 PSO. We can discuss a little bit how to do a C6 at the end. And you can see with good correction of his head uh, position. And we use the ear kind of as a surrogate when we look at the patient clinically to make sure the ear is moved back over the thoracic inlet. Another concept which we've been looking at for our classification is something called extension reserve. We find that this is something that patients can become symptomatic with. They have difficulty looking up um, and that also limits them to some extent. They complain about it and it shows exactly how much extension reserve that these patients have. This is most useful in my PJK or PJF patients. If a patient has no extension reserve, that's a patient in my mind I think is probably gonna come uh, to surgery. Uh, if somebody still has good extension reserve, uh, we think maybe they're not going to come to surgery anytime soon. This is a patient that we operated on for that problem uh, for extension reserve issues. He had a three column osteotomy. And again, we're moving his head back over his thoracic inlet. And maybe I'll finish up uh, with, uh, with this case and we'll see, uh, we take some issues uh, with complications at the end, maybe during the discussion. Also for cervical thoracic scoliosis, asymmetric PSO can be very helpful, uh, like in this patient with a torticollis type deformity. And I just wanna show you, we use the racks and we can close uh, one side more than the other. So we hold one side rigid and close one side and we can correct uh, the patients sagittally, simultaneously, and then keep closing one side, hold the other side rigid and you can get uh, a nice correction of the uh, coronal plane deformity. Um, Frank, just stop me when you wanna to start to uh, go to the discussion. This is um, uh, our work on complications. This was work headed up by Justin Smith. I, I never wanna finish the talk without saying these patients have high complication rates. Um, the main complication that we've struggled with in our practice is a C8 palsy. Uh, we've been progressively moving our osteotomies lower. We used to do a lot of C7. Now we almost never do C7. We really, uh, we, uh, we do C7 only very rarely. We never do T1 if we can avoid it at all cost. We really try to do these at T2 or T3 if possible to avoid that nerve issue. We still see it very occasionally, but moving the osteotomy lower is not only more powerful, it also avoids the C8 nerve issue, which is always in our experience silent on neuromonitoring. We don't pick it up with a motor change. This is a patient with uh, that problem. You can see the hand atrophy that they have, very severe problem, uh, and it's really uh, problematic for them. Finally, DJK, big problem for us. Um, we haven't totally solved it. 
We tried uh, ligament augmentation to prevent it using the Medicrea product. It wasn't as effective as it is in the, um, th uh, the, the uh, thoracolumbar spine. And finally, this is the last little pearl I'll show you. We started doing this. So at the bottom of our constructs, we direct our screw up, uh, crossing the disc space if possible. Uh, and this is an example of that. So at the bottom of these long constructs to prevent at least the windshield washering induced um, uh, DJK, we direct the screws up across the disc and into the adjacent vertebral body. And finally, we've been doing these procedures and taking them much longer below the thoracic apex. That's the other little pearl to prevent DJK is going quite a bit lower across the thoracic apex. You would never stop a thoracolumbar case at T8 you know, or T7, but we used to do that you know, way too much um, in the, um, in the cervical uh, thoracic deformity. So we go lower and finally just, you know, be careful with your connectors. They can rotate uh, on the vertebral, uh, on the rods and you can lose correction using some of these uh, connectors. So uh, put cross links on to avoid the, the, uh, the rod to rod uh, migration of your connectors if you're using that for a junctional uh, correction. They'll actually migrate anteriorly, not loosen, still stay connected, but you'll lose your sagittal correction. So. Uh, that's it. If you have any more questions, uh, we have a book on this we wrote with Dan Rue and uh, and Professor Abumi, and um, I think I actually made it Frank through through most yeah. of it. So uh, that was that was a phenomenal <laughs> talk. I, I love listening to you talk all the time. I learned so much. You actually hit this. There, there's a question from the panelists uh, from the attendees about the strategies for distal junctional kyphosis and, and your LIV, and you just said it. But can you summarize? You want to go past the apex. You you drive it through the disc space. What are some of the things that you do to really pick that LIV in, in your CT cases? Yeah, in our in our cervical thoracic. So I, I would say number one, uh, if you if it, if it is the uh, the AI type uh, cervical segmental deformity, especially if you have uh, a significant amount of upper thoracic kyphosis, try to try to stay anterior and do something limited because if you're going to go long and you're going to do a three column osteotomy, which you, you know, we have to do a lot of the time, you really have to go below the thoracic apex, at least in our hands, the, the failure rate was way too high stopping and doing a T2 PSO or T1 PSO and stopping at T4 or T5, they almost all fell over. That so was. we, we now go to T9 or T10. Sometimes in very severe cases, we'll actually go to the first uh, lordotic lumbar segment like they do in you know, the Sherman's uh, mm -hmm. sort of literature. Um, so we've been, going much, we've been going far longer, but that also has another implication, which I'm not entirely comfortable with, which is when they fail, <laughs> which is what some of them do, you end up taking a cervical case and pretty soon you know, you'll have an army of uh, C2 to pelvis patients. So yeah. you have to be very careful, but if you really want to get the correction and be sure of it, you do have to go longer. So that that's one thing. The screws have been helpful. They probably dropped our rates, you know, anecdotally at least, you know, five or ten percent. Um, the tapes haven't been as effective for DJK. Probably needs another solution beyond tethering. Um, so those are our thoughts. Um, you know, I on that, it's difficult. Yeah, I think that's great. It's a phenomenal talk, and I think your references and you've written quite a bit about it. We I think we just got about a minute left and. I think I wanted to just uh, thank you and, and everybody else for uh, putting this together and and, and have a, and have everybody enjoy the rest of Skull of Sacrum too as well. Thank you very much, Chris. Thanks so much, Frank, and thanks, Medtronic. You guys have a good day.